Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Charles Rivers, for organizing this and allowing me to speak. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about how the culture is starting to shift their minds around psychedelics. And I can say when I started my graduate program at the University of Texas in 2004, that we were studying addictive potential of different substances, including MDMA. And the study I was actually working on uh, to address your point about the relevance of music was we were studying how serotonin and dopamine release is impacted in rodent brains while listening to music, white noise, or other environmental conditions. Uh, and the reason for this was uh, funding from the Department of Defense to really understand uh, MDMA as a party drug and the potential negative consequences. Uh, but what we found was there is a synergistic activation of the reward pathway with MDMA and music. So it's been replicated now in humans with LSD neuroimaging studies that there could actually be a really relevant role of the environment where someone takes a psychedelic compound and also the uh, visual or hearing or auditory effects that are applied there. Um, and I can say in 2004, I never thought I'd be standing on a stage talking about MDMA as a potential treatment for addiction disorders. So it's really uh, been a huge change in, in history now to, to be at this place. And so just to, to frame this conversation, the opioid crisis is really sweeping through our nation. Uh, no figure could really capture the heartache and despair that this causes individuals and families. Uh, this graph here shows the opioid uh, rate of overdose deaths, and we can see the blue line is a sharp escalation. A lot of this is caused by fentanyl, um, but nonetheless, um, the last 12 months from April 2021 showed that 100,000 people had overdosed from opioid-related causes. And it's projected, if these trends continue, that 1.2 million people will die in the next decade. So it's imperative that we find new treatment strategies and also preventative strategies to, to prevent these types of uh, deaths. Um, historically, we know that in the 1950s and 60s, after Albert Hoffman first synthesized LSD in 1938, there was a lot of research trying to figure out what could you possibly use LSD to treat and what purpose could this have for our society? And alcohol use disorders was one of the most um, prominent in indication studies. Uh, they had the most participants in these studies of LSD-assisted psychotherapy, but there was a lot of heterogeneity, there was less rigor in how they were designed. Um, but nonetheless, they showed somewhere between a 30 to 50% abstinence rate, which was a, a really marvelous finding at the time. Um, but then again, there were some studies that didn't show any changes in drinking behavior. And that kind of leads us to um, another uh, study that was published in 2012, a meta-analysis that looked at six of these studies controlled for the heterogeneity and found that uh, the LSD-treated group had about a 59% response rate compared to the control group of 38%. We all know what happened next. This uh, got very popular amongst the counterculture. San Francisco was really known for the uh, band of merry pranksters that popularized LSD and their acid test. It got out of hand, I guess, rather quickly where the government came in in 1970s and basically halted all research in the late 60s. The Controlled Substance Act in the 1970s placed these substances in the highest restriction of drug classifications. Uh, Schedule one substances are known to have no known medical use, a high potential for abuse. And then the last point is a lack of accepted safety, even under medical supervision. Um, as we already heard, uh, Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, after being sober for two decades, he had an LSD experience. And what he really spoke about was how much that it helped his depression. And he said, I am certain that the LSD experience has helped me very much. And this was in 1957. I find myself at a, with a heightened color perception and appreciation of beauty almost destroyed by my years of depression. 
The sensation that the partition between here and there has become very thin is constantly with me. So he speaks of uh, the spiritual nature of this uh, experience that he had and why it could potentially be useful for those that are in recovery from alcohol use. Um, but this wasn't adopted by AA. Uh, this is a largely abstinence-based um, organization, which now as we're starting to see, uh, maybe psychedelic treatments could be part of this paradigm for recovery. It's uh, really going to be interesting to see if there's more acceptance in peer support groups around this. And I do want to mention uh, online group Psychedelics and Recovery. Uh, they are focused on supporting people that are using psychedelics intentionally as part of uh, their path to uh, overcoming substance use. They follow an AA model, so they uh, take the principles and the, and the values there and, and apply it to how psychedelics could be a part of that. So with the new interest, uh, we've seen lots of, uh, we see lots of different uh, drug classifications of psychedelics. The disassociative psychedelics like ketamine and ibogaine uh, are really interesting. Uh, in the 1990s, some studies in Russia were already pointing to the use of ketamine to be potentially helpful for substance use. Ibogaine has a unique pharmacology in that it does act on U and kappa opioid receptors and is known um, anecdotally to, to reduce craving and, and withdrawal symptoms as uh, someone is trying to withdraw from opioids. So that's a really uh, interesting one uh, on its own, and it's uh, derived from uh, the aboga plant, uh, which has been used traditionally by in West Africa by Bawiti traditions for, for many years. Uh, the other classical psychedelics, like we just heard, um, psilocybin has been researched for alcohol and nicotine dependence, as well as there's a small study going for cocaine, cocaine dependence and now extending to methamphetamines. Most of these studies, which is important to note, is they combined uh, motivational enhancement therapy and cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy as part of the prep and integration. And then the psilocybin experiences are largely non-directive. So by, you know, it's this idea of combining uh, traditional modalities with psychedelics and seeing if we can really amplify the effects and positive outcomes. There's several other um, compounds that we could talk about as classical psychedelics. Ayahuasca, uh, the active constituent is DMT, LSD, mescaline, and 5-MeO-DMT. All of these are uh, being investigated or of interest for addiction recovery. There's a lot of people going to ayahuasca retreats and reporting that uh, it's profoundly helpful for them to overcome uh, problematic use with substances. And it's um, not clear exactly how these all work, but um, more research to come. And then the talk of you know, the focus of this talk is a class of drugs, the intactogens. MDMA is unique in its pharmacology compared to the uh, 5-HT2A uh, classical psychedelics. Uh, so there's other analogs, MDA, and a number of other ones that may potentially come to market over time. So what are the mechanisms? Uh, we've heard quite a bit today about possible mechanisms, but what seems really important for recovery is that, uh, you know, this can be a chronic relapsing disorder. Oftentimes there are underlying drivers of addiction. Uh, trauma is known to be a, a really big one. Uh, people tend to start to self-medicate if they're feeling low mood or uh, unable to confront maybe a traumatic event that happened to them. Uh, so we can understand that uh, psychotherapy could address a number of the issues that might actually be why someone is, is seeking substances and, and why it might be a, a problematic way. The other aspect is mystical and spiritual type experiences. These can allow someone to have great reflection, novel insights, Perhaps they understand something different about their behaviors and gain some motivation to make those changes. Perhaps that's related to neuroplasticity in the brain, uh, which the last point here is these possible neurobiological effects that we've heard about uh, today in some of the talks. Uh, 
might be changes in how brain regions communicate. There could be any inflammatory effects, possibly epigenetic modifications. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that I really believe that it's a, uh, these mechanisms coming together in the practices and skills that someone can learn uh, to better cope with stress or to better cope with life, um, all, all can kind of converge in a really powerful treatment. Um, because one thing we know is a lot of people have taken psilocybin, millions of people take MDMA every year, but their substance use problems don't spontaneously remit. So I really feel that these other elements and the intention behind uh, taking a psychedelic for addiction treatment um, has a lot of factors at play for the positive responses. MDMA-assisted therapy is a, a really unique approach. As I mentioned, MDMA has a unique pharmacology compared to the other classical psychedelics. It's been most researched for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The first study kicked off in the year 2000 in Spain, and now uh, the second phase three trial for MDMA-assisted therapy is uh, about to wrap up. We know there's a high co-occurrence of uh, PTSD and substance use disorder, uh, yet, you know, it's oftentimes that uh, um, clinicians or, or research trials will design uh, a study or a treatment approach that wants to address one, like we want to work on your PTSD and then we'll work on the substance use. But really, these are quite entangled in having an approach that could uh, work with a population of people experiencing both of these would, would be a really uh, novel approach for mental health treatments. So what are the effects of MDMA? Uh, someone can feel a lot of, can feel enhanced empathy for themselves and for others. Uh, this aspect of uh, self-love is talked about a lot with MDMA. The closeness to others might come in when we think about the therapeutic alliance between a participant and the therapy team. If someone is able to have this increased interpersonal trust or bonding, uh, the prosocial effects of MDMA are measured um, in animal models as well as humans. So it does uh, allow someone to be a little bit more open to experience. Perhaps there's some euphoria or well being. With the MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD, there is a lot of focus on trauma processing and. Um, it's a really long session, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this slide shows um, just that there's only been a few neuroimaging studies that have administered MDMA and then measured changes in the brain while someone is having the acute drug effects. And this slide kind of combines the findings across some different studies. But I wanted to highlight a few things that are really interesting with possible underlying mechanisms is that we know that there's a decrease in blood flow to the amygdala. This is a core emotional processing region, particularly involved in the fear response. There's a decreased activity in the hippocampus, which is important for memory and uh, emotion. But uh, in between the hippocampus and amygdala during resting state, there's actually an increase in functional connectivity, which suggests that these regions might be uh, communicating more under MDMA. There's also a decrease in activity from the prefrontal cortex, um, decrease in connectivity uh, to these emotional memory processing areas, which suggests that maybe the maybe someone as they're experiencing MDMA is less in their uh, loops or thinking cognitively about things, thinking about their trauma, but not actually feeling the emotions. Um, processing memory and emotion in that way. Uh, there's a common uh, numbing effects often with uh, PTSD or disassociative effects of this disorder where someone might not be as in touch with emotion as uh, could be therapeutically valuable during these therapies. Um, so the pharmacology is, is quite unique. It's a reuptake inhibitor of uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And secondary to this is the release of hormones, including oxytocin, prolactin, vasopressin, and cortisol. And this uh, 
artistic diagram here is just showing that MDMA is the sly fox and it's releasing all the sheep from the pen. So the, uh, you know, drug is able to trick the brain into releasing a lot of neurochemicals into the synapse where they have several downstream effects. So the therapeutic approach that is used in uh, MAP studies uh, really came under development based on, over, based on the historical work that was pioneered by Stan Groff and Ralph Metzer and, and many others. So the manual has evolved through the years. Dr. Michael Mithofer and Annie Mithofer uh, originally wrote the manual and as new information has come in through the years, it's been adapted uh, and expanded. But the general premise is that there's always a co-therapy team, uh, two therapists, and uh, these could be, this could be a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, licensed marriage family therapists, nurses, social workers. And it looks like the FDA and the way MAPS is trying to move is to have one licensed professional, one paraprofessional who will have training but may not have um, a licensed uh, degree, mental health degree. So to be seen uh, what will come with that, but uh, the studies were conducted with, with professionals that had at least a thousand hours of trauma experience in working with patients with uh, PTSD. The approach is uh, interdirected or non-directive, meaning the participant might go through times of putting on eye shades and headphones and having an internal experience and then coming out and talking with the therapy team. It was uh, trauma focused, so if the trauma didn't naturally come up, then the therapist would. I think if they said it always would come up, pretty much. And so uh, the dialogue there with MDMA is uh, can be a, can look like a lot of talking um, between the participant and therapy team. MDMA is also uh, in a way it's less visual or, or less um, huge shifts in consciousness. It's a little bit more controllable in some ways. And in that way, it's a, a gentler, uh, can be a gentler experience in some ways. Um, but the whole purpose of this therapy team is to be there as uh, safety. They're there to support what's emerging for the participant. Uh, they want to, you know, really create this trust and, and space for them to experience whatever is going to happen. Um, it's non-judgmental, they remain curious, and they don't pathologize multiplicity. And this kind of speaks to the point of different modalities that are brought into this therapy, uh, somatic-based therapies, um, internal family systems, which works a lot with parts, uh, parts of the psyche. So all of uh, these different types of modalities can be incorporated with MDMA. And uh, it was really interesting to see as the phase three studies expanded to more therapists and sites, just the, the variety of skills and, and expertise and modalities that the therapy teams were bringing in. Um, so oh, as we've seen today, that's main. there's three main buckets of these sessions. There's the preparation. Uh, typically there were three 90 minute sessions. This was to allow the participant to build rapport, to get to know the therapy team and the therapy team to know them, prepare them for what the NDMA experience would be like. Uh, MDMA sessions uh, typically last about six to eight hours. Uh, there's a dose given in the morning and then an optional supplemental dose given about two hours into the session that's equal to half the first dose. This is a way of uh, expanding the window of time for the therapeutic sessions. Um, and then also there could be some variability in the subjective effects of any given participant. So this allows a little bit of uh, dosing flexibility uh, with the supplemental. And then the integration sessions are very important too. Uh, for most of the studies, the participants stayed overnight in the clinic and the first integrative visit happened the morning after. And this is a uh, non-drug sessions. It's about working with the material that came up during the MDMA sessions and uh, continuing that therapeutic work. And so how does it work? Like. What's going on here? This is like a, a big question that <laughs> comes up and kind of how I perceive this is it's an overlap and likely contributing factors of these three main domains, uh, the psychological, neurobiological, and environmental. And um, 
just to mention a few other rodent studies that have shown MDMA could um, extinguish uh, fear, conditioned fear response much more rapidly than a vehicle. Uh, there's a possibility of memory reconsolidation. It's more hypothetical. We wrote a review about this several years ago, um, just talking about how we did a moment ago, the brain regions involved in the neurochemicals really do suggest there could be this time where the memory opens up and is more liable to uh, new information or uh, refiling back into the brain in a way that is no longer tri triggering for the uh, person. And we've uh, heard of participants describing it that way. It's like, uh, you know, the PTSD symptoms of flashbacks or nightmares, or it's like always something underlying in their subconscious that was keeping them on edge. Uh, but after going through this therapy, it really just seemed like that the trauma was like you, there, you still have that memory, but it was less uh, on their mind or less triggering their central nervous system to uh, respond. So it's highly uh, hypothetical, but I think over time with more neuroimaging studies, we'll learn more about memory processing and MDMA. Um, the, you know, as we're talking about the environment, the supportive setting, music, co-therapy team, integration, uh, the trauma processing, novel insights from the psychological aspects, uh, but also the placebo effects. I do believe there's a, a big placebo effect going on with psychedelics, and I don't really see that as a negative. It's if we can consistently recreate a placebo effect or enable someone to uh, feel that they are moving in the right direction, and that's really bolstering their, their motivation or, or um, feeling that they have greater capacity, then I believe that to be a really powerful mechanism and an important one uh, for this therapy. So now we're gonna talk about alcohol use disorders uh, with MDMA-assisted therapy. There's really been uh, very little data collected on this topic, very few studies, and only one open-label study, which was conducted in Bristol and the Imperial College of London in the UK with Dr. Ben Sesa as the PI, and he's now with Awaken Life Sciences where they are continuing on this work with MDMA and ketamine uh, for alcohol use disorders. So this uh, first proof of concept study, it was open label, they enrolled 14 patients, and uh, the model was that they underwent a community detox uh, before they initiated the MDMA-assisted therapy. And they were using MAPS model and MAPS MDMA for that part of the study. Uh, there were two MDMA sessions. The total dose was 187.5, so that's the first dose and the supplemental um, combined there, and uh, a lot of psychological support. So what they found here is um, this graph is showing... Uh, a study that they conducted, the, the black line, was a community detox and then uh, treatment as usual um, in the UK for alcohol use disorders. And then the brown line there showing this MDMA-assisted therapy study that they did. And uh, they layered these on to show this comparison that um, with the timeline follow back, this is a measure of alcohol drinking over time that the percentage of patients that were consuming more than the 14 recommended uh, daily units of alcohol, I think it's, must be weekly. <laughs> I, don't think I don't think the limit's 14, but I have here daily. Um, that what they found was like this really big difference between the MDMA uh, study they did and the treatment as usual. And at their final time point there at nine months, there was as much as 75% of the MDMA treated group was still not meeting this threshold of problematic use. And so this is a huge difference between 21% versus 75% in the observation. Um, for the MDMA assisted PTSD trial, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the phase three study that was completed uh, in 2021. Uh, this is published and it was conducted by MAPS. So they were enrolling chronic severe PTSD, uh, randomizing them to receive either psychotherapy with a placebo or psychotherapy with MDMA. Uh, there were 
the main outcome was a measure of PTSD severity. The clinicians administered PTSD scale five. And uh, the final analysis had, it was 89, the slide's wrong. Uh, I think there are 89 participants that uh, completed. The secondary measures, there were several, such as um, uh, a measure of uh, eating disorder, eating or what could be uh, problematic or associated with a disorder for some, um, functional impairment, as well as the audit and the due date, which is the alcohol, um, alcohol use identification test and the drug use identification test. And these are really short self-report measures that gauge drinking behaviors, uh, cravings, and, and how much someone is using drugs or alcohol. And so these were both secondary measures. And um, yeah, just to be clear, they, they weren't enrolling participants uh, that had active substance use, but they did enroll participants that had uh, mild alcohol or cannabis use disorder. Um, and yeah, the substance use disorder participants were excluded if they had active use within the 12 prior months to enrollment. Um, so the information we have is, is really limited to a, let's say mild to moderate substance using um, population, alcohol and cannabis. This was the study design here. There's a rigorous screening uh, procedure three preparatory, preparatory sessions. Uh, the baseline CAPS was given after a few prep sessions. And uh, this was because when people started undergoing psychotherapy, uh, a lot of times you have some improvement. So we really wanted to understand how would the MDMA sessions, um, what would be the change you know, after we had already started uh, undergoing psychotherapy. Uh, this study was randomized, so the MDMA sessions were either MDMA or placebo, spaced a month apart with uh, integrative visits in between. The dosing was changed to 80 milligrams for the first session. Everyone received that. Session two and three, it was a choice to go up to 120 milligrams. There was also the supplemental av available. Uh, most participants do go up to the 120 milligrams, but it does give that flexibility uh, depending on how someone may be experiencing MDMA. The primary endpoint happened two months after the final MDMA session, uh, which is a, a nice time course to see are these effects actually lasting longer than a few days, uh, because most likely MDMA won't be a substance that can be taken uh, regularly, like weekly or daily. Uh, the model here is really about catalyzing the therapeutic experience to give someone a longer outcome of remission. Uh, so this is the CAPS-5 PTSD severity uh, scores. Uh, there was a significant difference between the placebo group in blue and the red group is MDMA treated. It uh, was significant at the last primary endpoint and a really um, nice separation of the groups that replicated the phase two findings. For the alcohol use um, identification test here, at baseline in red is the MDMA group. And um, this is a, uh, and then the placebo group is there represented in blue. And uh, we do see that the groups aren't exactly uh, starting off at baseline level. They weren't randomized to be so. So this was just by chance. And at the post-treatment, the primary endpoint, uh, these groups look almost identical. If the, when we look at the change score, we do actually see a significant difference between these groups with the MDMA group showing a greater change. However, when the baseline scores were controlled, this effect was no longer significant. Um, for, the, for the drug use scale, um, it's interesting that the MDMA group is a little bit lower than the placebo group at baseline on this measure. Um, and then post-test, uh, we see uh, there wasn't a difference at this between the groups at the post-test, and nor was there a difference between the groups on the change scores. Um, and what's we can take this information with um, it's interesting, but there's several limitations about trying to understand MDMA's effect on alcohol or cannabis use. Uh, the study didn't intentionally enroll uh, active substance use. Uh, there wasn't a measure of 
Uh, what was your drinking like in the past few days or the months as the timeline follow back? It's a lot more uh, detailed information. Uh, so that piece is interesting. You know, it might help as someone's PTSD severity is improving. Uh, we would, you know, probably expect that other domains of their life might also improve, including uh, their relationship with substance. Um, the therapy intervention was not focused on addiction recovery, uh, like we see for the alcohol and nicotine studies. There's also a lack of correction for multiple statistical tests. So the phase three study had several secondary outcome measures. And um, if you don't correct for testing multiple times, the chance of a false positive is um, can happen. And so, you know, this is really considered preliminary evidence that MDMA, um, this type of approach might be useful for those with uh, substance use problems. Um, so what's next? Uh, so many questions. <laughs> but um, for sure, we, you know, we want to understand, like, what types of addiction disorder would MDMA potentially work for? Uh, there's lots of different substances people struggle with. There's also behavioral disorders like gambling or sex addiction. Um, can MDMA can be combined with some of these traditional modalities that we know are quite effective for substance use? Um, and then also, you know, the co-occurring disorder of MDMA, of PTSD and substance use or, or other, uh, other comorbid comorbidities, um, you know, is this going to be differential depending on each individual's unique state? Um, another big question is the, the rate of relapse and how often could you re-administer MDMA? Uh, the paradigm is only tested three doses, except for one study. There was uh, one group of six people that had six, se six sessions of MDMA. Um, so to be seen, if uh, the relapse if can be retreated with MDMA, what type of spacing in between dosing would be necessary for safety? Uh, so more questions there. As far as um, MDMA is assisted therapy for alcohol use and other substance disorders, Awaken Life Sciences in the UK is continuing uh, their research with MDMA assisted therapy for alcohol use disorders. Uh, they also have a program with ketamine for treating alcohol use disorders, uh, ketamine assisted therapy. I found this study on clinicaltrials.gov at the University of New Mexico is going to be looking at co-occurring PTSD and opioid use disorder in postpartum people. Um, this will be a study of MDMA. At Brown University, I'm um, collaborating with a, a colleague there who I worked with at the Ernest Gallo Clinic and Research Center years ago, uh, Carolina um, Hasselhoff and some of her colleagues at the VA are going to do a small pilot to look at veterans that have PTSD and substance use. Uh, there'll be a neuroimaging component and the treatment component, and this will start getting into some of these questions about um, how to deliver the therapy, is it effective, um, and all of that. And um, I know MAPS is also interested in continuing, continuing the exploration of MDMA for substance use, um, but I'm not aware of any studies planned right now or that will be started uh, in the near future. So one big question, is MDMA addictive? Because as I mentioned in my earlier graduate work, uh, this drug is really known as a party drug. Uh, we do know that there can be problematic use in recreational contexts. Um, and this is a really important question that we need to ask if we're going to be potentially prescribing this to individuals that might be at a higher risk for substance use. The animal studies um, that measure reward and reinforcement um, paint an interesting picture of MDMA. MDMA rats will self-administer MDMA, but to a much lesser extent than cocaine. Uh, they also will substitute MDMA in a cocaine substitution paradigm. And this may relate to the dopaminergic effects uh, that's common between both of these. Um, condition place preference with MDMA um, it's less than what you see with cocaine, but you can induce it. Uh, it's more pronounced in socially isolated animals. And we also see that MDMA lowers the threshold 
and increases the response of uh, uh, rate for self-stimulation. And so this is a, a common property of drugs that have addiction potential. Um, there's increased locomotor activity and repetitive stereotypical behaviors at higher doses of MDMA. And then there's also the prosocial effects. And so from this, it's considered that MDMA has a either mild to moderate uh, potential for addiction, um, but probably more information is needed to understand uh, how this is, well, we'll talk a little bit about the clinical trial findings in a moment. Uh, this study was published in 2010. It looked at several different substances and they created a score for how much these substances were um, creating harm to oneself or harm to others. Uh, alcohol is the highest scoring one on the chart here for potential harms. And ecstasy is uh, the street name or recreational name of MDMA. And uh, that's down on the chart towards the lower end at a score of nine. And so this uh, suggests that, you know, across substances, um, you know, while there is a necessity for harm reduction, uh, that it's a less, uh, can be um, less potent, harmful substance than something that is legally prescribed or legally available like alcohol. But from human um, use in non-medical context, uh, it's, you know, it's varying opinion about how addictive uh, MDMA can be. Uh, it is known some individuals will, will develop dependence or misuse and experience uh, withdrawal symptoms such as fatigue, appetite loss, concentration problems. And this is really important to think about because there's also evidence from recreational users. Uh, oftentimes it's been poly drug users that the studies have uh, investigated, but there can be some long-term uh, effects, memory deficits and increased psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, and psychosis. And it's generally been shown that as uh, someone discontinues ecstasy use, uh, that these symptoms will start to mitigate. Um, but nonetheless, it's uh, important as we're talking about introducing someone uh, with a substance use disorder, uh, potentially uh, a substance that could be misused outside the clinical context. So more information is really needed about the safety and tolerability of MDMA. Um, in clinical trials uh, at MAPS, the phase two studies, 91 participants completed the long-term follow-up. Uh, for most studies, this was a year after the treatment phase. And there was a question of, did you use MDMA or ecstasy after the study? Um, of the 91 people, eight said they had, and they had used it one or two times to recreate a therapeutic experience at home. Um, there was no adverse events related to craving or uh, problematic substance use after the trial. For the phase three study, there haven't been any adverse events during the main treatment phase. And um, it's not, the long-term follow-up hasn't occurred yet. So they haven't reported yet uh, what the use might be following the study. Um, the limitations here again are that these studies weren't actually enrolling participants that have active substance use. So it could be different um, if it did. Uh, so just some closing remarks and a recap is that the preliminary data is very encouraging for using MDMA-assisted therapy uh, for substance use disorders. Uh, if it can catalyze the therapeutic experience, it does seem that uh, it could be a modality of use for this population that we know uh, oftentimes doesn't respond well to conventional treatments. There's very little research, as I mentioned, on the tolerability and efficacy in this population. I expect that to be expanding quite a bit in the years to come. And, um, you know, it does carry some low to moderate misuse or potential addictive properties in non-medical settings. So it's something to be aware of uh, for, for those doing this type of work. And, um, yeah, it's just important that we understand what the potential risk might be. So I also wanted to share a little bit more about our work at um, Project New Day. This is a nonprofit foundation uh, that was co-founded with Mike Sinyard, who's the founder of Specialized Bicycles. Uh, he's really passionate about helping people overcome addiction with psychedelic treatments, um, as well as other mental health conditions. 
And so Project New Day was established for advocacy, to fund research, and to support treatments. And so uh, we recently gave a grant to Natura Care Programs. Uh, this is a, a new addiction recovery program that's going to be doing prep and integration and then doing ayahuasca retreats in, in Costa Rica. It's a blending of a few different modalities that they're using of Western and ceremonial use. And so the grant from Project New Day is allowing some uh, allowing scholarships for a number of the participants that uh, could otherwise not afford to participate. Um, and then Psychedelic Support is a web platform that I co-founded in 2018. It's really about bringing uh, more education on psychedelics. So we create continuing medical education courses. Uh, we have free harm reduction courses and articles. There's a directory of over a thousand health providers who are open-minded to work with people after psychedelic experiences, or they also work with ketamine and cannabis. Uh, so there's a lot of great uh, resources there. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, this work. And Natur Care Programs is enrolling their first cohort to start in July. Um, if you have, I think there's still a few spots left. If there's anybody that um, might benefit from a program like that, you could share uh, the website with them and they could check it out there. So thanks so much. I'm happy to take some questions. R versus MDMA for PTSD? There hasn't been any studies that enrolled and randomized people to both of these treatments. And uh, I think that will be a really interesting studies to come. Um, you know, there, there are a number of people that respond really well to EMDR and also prolonged exposure. But we know that a number of people suffering from PTSD just can't get relief from, from those modalities or from medications that can be prescribed like antidepressants. Uh, so more work to come about uh, what approach might be better. It might be different for different people. Um, but one thing I find really interesting, and I maybe some neurobiological research could be conducted to understand this, is MDMA has this effect of causing eyes to flutter and move around. And with EMDR, that's one of the purposes of like uh, using eye movement as a way of allowing deeper um, processing to occur in the brain. Now, I've always wondered, is there a link between these modalities and what MDMA does um, through a pharmacological way? So. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I think, great, well, thank you, Allison. Yeah. Great talk, thank you. Uh, how much more effective do you think MDMA therapy could be for addiction if if it was focused on that? Because it seems like the, the data you showed, it was focused on PTSD. And I know it's comorbid and related, but if you like did what they did with the smoking or alcohol with psilocybin. Yeah, I think it could be a really profound uh, catalyzer of helping someone maybe address and think deeper about or experience something deeper about why are they, um, pursuing substances in a problematic way, or is there relational stress? Is there life stress? Can we uh, have better coping me mechanisms? So yeah, I think it, once it's really, um, the intention can really drive a response. And so I could see that MDMA would be, um, has a really good chance of, of helping those with substance use. And you know, one thing we've been particularly interested with Project New Day is understanding uh, peer support groups and how to uh, make this more accessible to more people. We know that recovery, you know, it's not going to just, uh, your problems don't vanish after you take MDMA a few times. And so the long-term support that can come from peers that have undergone the same thing, there's less, um, you know, there's a lot of isolation or depression, depression that can uh, coexist with substance use. So really building that safety and support to get the most out of the medicine sessions uh, is, is really a, I think where this work needs to head. All right, one more question. I just want to check, uh, Alec, do you know the withdrawal uh, at the beginning, you know, trying to get folks off SSRIs, SNRIs, how long did MAPS, like in the phase three trial, did they give them a full month to taper off or 
And and did you see a lot of people like were there people who screened themselves out because they knew they couldn't tolerate the SSRI withdrawal? Yeah, that's a good um, point. So for these studies, participants had to taper off their psychiatric medications. And as a, typically it's five half-lives was the taper period. Um, but we know with uh, SSRIs from the phase two studies, uh, we did a subgroup analysis and we looked at uh, folks that had tapered off of drugs classified as reuptake inhibitors, so SSRIs, SNRIs um, of these type of classes. And there was a big difference between those who had tapered and those who had not. And their response to MDMA, including their blood pressure increases, and then the PTSD um, symptom severity didn't improve as much for the subgroup that had tapered. And, you know, open questions of, is there a neurobiological effect of uh, chronic use of SSRIs that uh, can internalize the uh, serotonin reuptake transporters? That's one of the mechanisms known to be involved in how these medications work. Um, and that's the primary target of MDMA. Um, so in the phase three study, I'm not sure in um, how many people they enrolled that had to taper off the medications. Um, it does also complicate things if there's uh, discontinuation syndrome. So whether or not there's a neurobiological effect, um, it's suffice to say someone might not be feeling so great to undergo the therapy as their uh, I guess homeostasis in the brain is resetting from you know years of medication use. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Allison.